In order to study proteins, we have to obtain the proteins from some type of source. And one of the most common types of sources are cells. Now the question is, once we obtain our sample of cells, how do we extract that protein of interest from inside the cells? Well, we expose the cells to process known as cell fractionation. And in cell fractionation, there are two important steps. In the first step, we have to form a homogenate. And the way that we form a homogenate is in the following manner. We take a test tube and we place the cells inside the test tube as shown in the following diagram. And then we expose the cells to some type of grinding or mixing process. And what that does is it breaks down and ruptures the cell membranes of the cells, exposing all the different types of components and, mix and mixing all these different types of components components found inside the cells. For example, we have the nuclei, we have the organelles such as mitochondria, we have the ribosomes and so forth, all these different things mixed in inside our test tube and this is called a homogenate. Now, once we form the homogenate, we now expose the homogenate to a process known as differential centrifugation. And we conduct several centrifugation processes as we'll see in just a moment. Now, if you don't, if you don't know what differential centrifugation is, we're going to focus on the details of that process in the next lecture. But what it basically does is it uses angular motion, it uses centripetal acceleration to basically separate the components inside the homogenate based on their density. So the more dense a certain component is, the lower along our test tube it will end up. And the less dense it is, the higher up along the test tube it will actually be. So in the first step, after step one, we basically take our test tube with, with our homogenate, we place it into the apparatus and it basically rotates and eventually it separates that mixture. So the very dense material ends up at the bottom, so this section, that is known as the pellet. And the rest ends up at the surface, so higher up, this entire section, that is known as the supernatant. Now, in the first centrifugation process, our acceleration is 1000 g's, where g is simply the gravitational pull due to the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. So 1000 g's basically means the molecules and things inside our test tube experience a gravitational or an acceleration that is 1,000 times as high as the gravitational acceleration. Now, in the first step, because we're only using 1,000 Gs, we're going to separate things like the nuclei of the cells. So in the pellet, we're going to have the nuclei, and above, in the supernatant, we're going to have everything else. So once we obtain this test tube, we basically remove the pellet and then we take the supernatant and we expose the supernatant to yet another centrifugation process. But now we bump our acceleration, we increase it to 10,000 Gs. Once we do that, we basically form a pellet that now contains our mitochondria, which are smaller than nuclei. And then we once again remove the pellet, we take the supernatant, we expose it to yet another, uh, another centrifugation process, and now we increase the value of the acceleration to 100,000 Gs. And what that does is it basically creates this pellet that now contains very tiny mitochondria microsomes and usually inside the supernatant are basically the proteins that we actually want to use. Now, in every step of, these process, of this process, we basically carry out some type of protein assay for that specific type of protein or enzyme that we actually want to study. And whenever we have, whenever we get the highest value for that protein activity, that's the fraction that we actually want to use. That's what the source of protein is that we're going to use. So once we obtain the source, uh, source of a mixture of proteins and inside that inside that mixture of protein we have that protein that we want to study that will act as the source and once we have the source we now can use a variety of different types of specific purification processes 
So proteins can be generally, uh, uh, proteins can be generally separated based on four important different types of properties. So based on the size of the protein, based on the solubility of the protein, how well it dissolves in a certain type of solvent, based on the charge, found on that protein and also based on the ability of that specific protein to bind to some specific type of biological molecule. For example, certain types of proteins are able to bind to specific type of DNA sequences and DNA molecules, while other proteins cannot bind to those DNA molecules. And using that property, we can separate them because of that ability to bind. So there are eight important types of purification processes that you should be familiar with. So in this lecture, we're simply going to go through these processes quickly, but in the next several lectures, we're actually going to discuss them in much more detail. So we have eight processes. We have dialysis. Now, the thing about dialysis is, it doesn't actually allow us to separate different proteins, but what it allows us to do is it allows us to separate the proteins from other small molecules and ions by using a semi-permeable membrane. Now, salting out is basically the process by which we separate our protein based on its ability to form a precipitate at a specific type of salt concentration. So, for example, one protein can precipitate at a concentration of salt, let's say around one molar, but another one will form a precipitate only at two molar and so forth. So, we can use salting out to basically separate different proteins. Now, gel filtration chromatography is a technique that uses uh, the size factor of proteins. It can, it can basically separate the proteins based on size. And in gel filtration chromatography, we have this uh, tube and inside the tube we have these special beads and so the proteins move along the tube and through the beads and the proteins that are largest will move fastest along the test tube and the ones that are smallest because they get trapped inside those beads they will move the slowest. Now in ion exchange chromat chromatography we separate our proteins based on their charge. In affinity chromatography, this is where we basically separate our protein based on its affinity, on its ability to attract itself to specific types of other molecules. So in our tube, we can basically uh, form these different types of specific molecules along the tube and as the proteins are allowed to move along the tube those proteins that do bind or are attracted to those molecules will bind to the surface of our tube but the ones that don't the proteins that don't will essentially move straight down along our tube and we'll discuss that in much more detail in the next several lectures. Now gel electrophoresis is something we spoke about already in biology. So gel electrophoresis is the process by which we separate, we use the charge on the protein to move that protein along an electric field and we basically separate the proteins based on size. So notice that gel filtration chromatography and gel electrophoresis, these two methods both use the size factor, but the major difference between gel electrophoresis and gel filtration chromatography is in gel electrophoresis, all the proteins actually move along that region, while in gel filtration chromatography, the very small proteins essentially are trapped inside the beads of that system, as we'll see in a future lecture. Now, in isoelectric focusing, this is where we separate our uh, proteins based on their isoelectric point. And the isoelectric point is that specific pH value at which the net charge on that protein is essentially neutral and we'll see exactly, uh, is essentially zero. And we'll see exactly what that means once again in a future lecture. Now, two-dimensional electrophoresis basically combines the isoelectric focusing method and the gel electrophoresis method. So every time we conduct one of these protein purification processes, as well as following the cell fractionation process, we basically have to determine what the enzyme activity is and what the enzyme concentration is 
in that sample because it's the enzyme activity and the concentration values that allows us to calculate the specific activity. And recall, it's the specific activity value that allows us to determine whether or not our sample is pure. So basically, the greater this value is, the more pure our sample of protein is. And every time we conduct these processes, at the end of the process, this value has to increase because if it increases, that means our method was successful and we were able to purify our sample and produce a sample that contains more of the proteins that we actually want to study and less of the proteins that we don't want to study.